Thank you very much, Miguel, uh, and thank you for inviting me and uh, uh, giving me an audience uh, uh, to share some of my ideas. Uh, I want to say I am really very, very fond of Manchester. Uh, for, uh, it has given me two things. Uh, well, it gave me my wife uh, of now 45 <laughs> years. She was born at St. Mary's Hospital just down the road here. And, uh, and my daughter, who was born just down there called Withington Hospital. <laughs> So I did my master's here, and uh, and uh, and I uh, not in education, but in department next door in philosophy. Uh, but uh, I really do. I'm always been fond of Manchester, and uh, every opportunity that I get, I take in order to uh, in order to uh, to renew my acquaintance with uh, with this fine city, which is getting better and more crowded every day. It seems uh, uh, it really is quite an interesting place. Uh, Okay, so what I want to do today is actually say something that is both topical and, of course, uh, something that is th theoretically very complicated as well. Um, I want to start off by actually saying that uh, every so often you read speeches that are really quite interesting because they reveal so much about how the world is changing. And uh, one of the speeches that I have paid a great deal of attention to it lasted only around 20 minutes, and it was not one of his ad-libbed uh, speeches, which invariably are abusive and, uh, and dreadful, but one of those speeches that he read. So in other words, it was a prepared speech of uh, uh, the President of the United States, Donald Trump, uh, on 25th of September 2018, which is last year, um, uh, about uh, 12 months ago. Uh, he delivered a most provocative speech at the UN General Assembly. You know that uh, um, countries, all the country leaders come to meet in, uh, in September every year. And this is a speech that he gave last week. In that speech, which was in many ways uh, reminiscent of the inaugural speech that he gave uh, a few years earlier, Trump took on the entire international political order the underlying principles of multilateralism and uh, international cooperation. He basically argued that uh, the system has, had, bro had broken down and that we needed to actually think about uh, the, uh, the ways in which uh, international relations were organized and the ways in which national governments related to each other in very different ways. He portrayed the United States as a major victim of the orders despite the fact that it was in fact the United States that produced and manufactured that order in the first place uh, from the beginning of uh, creating UN to the various other organizations like World Bank, uh, uh, World Trade Organization, etc. So US is the one who created that order and yet he's arguing that US has been a major victim. Of course that can be debated but uh, most people think that is an exaggeration as best flawed at, um, at worst, which has exploited the, by various uh, nefari nefarious external forces and presented, he presented himself as its savior. He basically promised the world that he was going to change the multilateral order and that, uh, that will uh, lead to it. Now the thing that was really interesting about his speech is a very sharp distinction, a fundamental binary that he drew between globalism and cosmopolitanism on the one hand and patriotism and nationalism on the other. In other words, he argued that you cannot be globalist and patriotic. You cannot be cosmopolitan and um, be a nationalist. You had to choose between either nationalism or patriotism. You had to choose between those two bi uh, elements of the boundary. He proposed a world in which each nation, which he assumed possessed its own distinctive traditions, values, and cultures, looked after its own national interest. In other words, uh, he wanted to create a system in which uh, uh, countries looked after their own interest uh, rather, than, uh, uh, rather than try to imagine that countries could get together and cooperate with each other. And that in this way, he assumed uh, a view of nationalism that was not only political, but also ethno-nationalist. Now remember, he's saying not 
that uh, each country had diversity of values. He's interested in saying each country had a singular set of privileged values. In other words, uh, he's arguing that somehow it, countries have to decide what their values are and stick to them rather than play around with silly things like multiculturalism and cultural pluralism and so on. Okay? Basically, that's actually what he's talking about. In other words, his position is both anti-pluralist and anti-secular. He is not interested in trying. He's interested in a, in that sense, he's interested in what is now called populism. Populism is an idea which makes a fundamental distinction between the people and the elite. And says that uh, the, the elites exploit the people. And what is necessary is for the people to have their general will articulated and respected. Now his view of general will is not a democratic one necessarily, because he argues that general will has a spiritual dimensions. That is, it comes from not only what people believe, but what people ought to believe because of their subjugation to something more divine than simply the people. In that sense, uh, he's arguing that uh, we need to be careful about, uh, about, about general will. General will is, ex is a divine will that is expressed through the common people, the people, the ordinary people, not the elite. Elites are the ones who are actually undermining the general will rather than. And that is basically his kind of populism that uh, he has been promoting along with him. Now, these ethno-nationalist sentiments are, of course, not unique to Donald Trump. Donald Trump has articulated it. He has probably not created it, uh, but uh, there are a large number of people around him who actually believe in this stuff. Uh, and uh, the most important person was his first policy advisor, uh, Steve Bannon. He, fundamentally, is an ethno-nationalist populist. Uh, Okay, and he's very, very committed to the ways. Now, the thing, of course, is, is that it's not unique. It is an idea, this populist idea, which is predicated, uh, which, is, which is linked to the idea of, of ethno-nationalism and uh, anti-pluralism, anti-globalism, and anti-secularism can be found around the world and is growing and growing at a very, very rapid rate. Around the world... We are seeing leaders after leaders coming along, becoming elected, elected quite often with large majorities, such as Narendra Modi in India, with 65% of the vote, who are basically populist in their orientation. But it's not only Narendra Modi, it's of course Marie Le Pen in uh, France, um, Oban in Hungary, Erdogan in uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Turkey, Bolsonaro, in uh, Brazil, and so on and so on. In other words, more and more countries are becoming, if you like, uh, nationalist uh, in ethno terms. And this is something that we need to think about. And what I want to do is actually understand what implications of the rise of populism and nationalism has for the new challenges that we who are interested in international education uh, confront. These ideas are, of course, arguably linked to the politics of Brexit that you are going through, have been going through forever, it seems, uh, <laughs> for at least three years anyway, in the United Kingdom. Um, some of the silt ideas have, uh, are there. It is anti-multilateral institutions. It is anti-secularist. It is anti-pluralist and it is anti-globalist. Okay. So around the world, so it seems, ethno-nationalist and anti-globalization sentiments are growing in popularity. Empirically, there is very little doubt about that. Okay. You can see over and over again. As somebody who travels quite a bit, I encounter the complaint about, complaints about populism almost in every place that I have, uh, I have, I have I have, I have been to in recent years. Uh, and that includes places like uh, Korea, includes places like Vietnam, 
and certainly aspects of uh, Australian politics are also. So this popularity cannot be doubted. And I think we need to understand then a number of questions and ask some very, very difficult questions. To what extent do these developments, do these developments collectively, ethno-nationalist uh, and uh, populist, point to a post-globalization era? To what extent is globalization, as has been articulated over the last 25 years, now needs to be rethought? Okay, in light of the populist imagination that is emerging. And if international higher education, or international education generally, represents an expression of and a response to the processes of globalization, how do these anti-globalization sentiments unsettle the project of internationalization upon which we have become so closely tied to? upon which uh, much of the future of uh, higher education in particular, but to a large extent education, has now become predicated. Okay? In other words, what is the complicated relationship between international education on the one hand, that is, if you like, uh, in favor of a particular kind of globalization, or global imaginary, if you like, and the kind of populist ideas that are emerging. Are we likely to see, as a result of this, as I said a little earlier in another group, are we likely to see higher education being positioned by the community that is increasingly buying into the populist ideas as the representation, the devil, that uh, is globalist by, in its essence? In other words, uh, is the distinction between higher education and the communities within which it is embedded likely to grow. And if they, that grows, then we need to think about as to how do we control it and how do we actually think about a community that is increasingly suspicious of the globalist ideas that uh, we have been uh, uh, committed to at least um, uh, for the, the last 30, 30 years or so. How, can, um, how realistic are the prospects of a return to ethno-nationalism. Is ethno-nationalism likely to grow and grow, thereby damaging higher education constitution uh, away from the internationalization that has become part and parcel of their normal um, uh, mission, if you like. How can the effects of the backlash against globalization be mitigated? And how might we now need to rethink about its challenges? and to prepare students in a world in which anti-globalization sentiments cannot be simply wished away. We cannot expect these ideas that have become increasingly popular and increasingly common, we can't expect that they're going to go away anytime soon. There are large communities and large number of people who are deeply committed to the, the, the populist ethno-nationalist ideas. How do we work with them? Okay, and how do we, uh, 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 to do, do we try to engage those people who have uh, within our communities such views? Because in my view, these sentiments cannot be defe defeated by the power of uh, facts and reason alone. They are deeply, deeply, deeply uh, linked to our emotions and our affect. In other words, the populist agenda is about some people believing that to be them, that are uh, assumed to be somehow undermining the, their distinctiveness, their cultural and their uh, uh, ideological distinctiveness. Now, let me actually go back to actually have a look at uh, internationalization of higher education. One of the problems with the literature on international higher education is that we look at uh, the empirical aspects of it, but not its normative aspects. Internationalization of higher education is being portrayed and presented as a good thing. In other words, it is being presented as a moral positive. Okay? Uh, it is a normative uh, sentiment rather than simply. So when we say the internationalization is a good thing, we have a whole battery of arguments.
to suggest why it is a good thing. In that sense, we are preferring internationalization to nationalization uh, or nationalist uh, agendas anyway. In that preference, we are clearly um, expressing our moral values. So in many ways, international higher education and internationalization of education as a process generally is largely a moral and normative agenda, which we need to actually recognize. It can also be seen as an expression of and a response to the processes of globalization. The contemporary's view of, of international education emerged, if you like, uh, in the early 1990s. Um, before that, international, international education was viewed differently in terms of a developmental logic, in terms of a cooperation logic. The neoliberal notion of international education really emerged at the beginning of 1990s. Okay, so it's relatively recent. And it coincided with the development of uh, the global economy and global mobility of people and global mobility of ideas. In that sense, there is a very, very close and intrinsic and inherent link between globalization and internationalization. The way that I have theorized that link is to say that uh, internationalization of higher education or internationalization of education is both an expression of and a response to the processes of globalization. In other words, uh, it is a reflection of the things that are happening in the community that we call globalization. And it is also a strategic a ploy to take advantage of those things that are happening. In other words, uh, we are both uh, reacting to the processes of globalization as well as uh, making those processes of globalization at the same time. So in that sense, international education does a huge amount of that. How does it do it? By putting a huge premium, perhaps even moral premium, on sharing of information, ideas, and ideologies. It says that international education should be that which encourages the sharing. The sharing is a moral concept in that sense. It's not an empirical concept. It's a moral. We are saying we should share, and sharing will produce necessarily good outcomes. It forges various regional and international links for cross-border cooperations. In other words, it says that the nation states are going to continue to exist, but we should try to create as many regional and international links as we possibly can that cross those borders. Again, a normative, normative statement, a normative assertion. It encourages global mobility of students and folk faculty, and as a result, we are traveling uh, all the time, or at least I am, uh, because I have been encouraged to do so. Okay, by my university, by my research, etc., etc. Even though I realize that environmentally I do a huge amount of damage on my footprint, um, carbon footprint. Uh, so basically what we're looking at is uh, we are making choices when we talk about international education. We are, we are saying that it is a good thing that uh, people are mobile. It opens up the possibility of sharing of instructional and research resources. In other words, uh, it actually pulls together ideas uh, in a whole range of It encourages research collaboration on shared problems. It focuses on the preparation of graduates for an increasingly global labor market. And it has resulted in the emergence of a global market in higher education, which means uh, that we have actually started participating in that market that we ourselves created in less than, three, uh, um, less than 30 years. Okay? This is a market that we created. Now much of the research on international education starts off with the market and then says there are all these things, uh, the, these normative things happening. I go the other way, I sort of saying market was created because we already thought certain things were important and we could use that as a justificatory scheme to create the market. In other words, there is a complicated relationship between the emergence of the market and the rationales that we give 
for internationalization. So that, in my view, is the bold view of, uh, as I see it, of internationalization of higher education. Okay? There are these elements about sharing, about, uh, about resources, about collaboration, about mobility, about connectivities. Those are the key, key ideas, normative ideas, that are, that are located within our discourses of internationalization of education. Now, I want to argue that the growing popularity of anti-globalization sentiments have arguably unsettled the key ideas that I have just described. Okay? That all of those ideas that I talked about are becoming unsettled by the anti-globalization rhetoric. Because all of them are expressions of globalization. You see what I'm trying to say? Okay? That given that we are getting uh, anti-globalization sentiments, they've got to have some effect in the ways in which we can sustain or continue to sustain the normative orientation towards uh, higher education in the ways that... Now these sentiments, these, sentim these anti-globalization sentiments, are aligned to the fears about the potential loss of national sovereignty, which are potentially exploited politically by ethno-nationalists. In other words, it is argued that uh, internationalization of this kind will inevitably lead to the loss of national sovereignty. And we've got to be careful. Our distinctiveness is disappearing. And you've seen that in the Brexit arguments uh, all, 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 all the time. People have sort of said, uh, since we joined European Union, our distinctiveness has evaporated. Okay? Our dis distinctiveness has been... That argument is taking place around the world. There are people who hate New York in the center of uh, United States because New York represents this globalist nirvana that they do not like. Okay? So in other words, uh, there is a tension that is emerging and is becoming much more intense than it was barely 10 years ago. It's suggested, moreover, that globalization is far too abstract and is normatively biased in the favor of the transnational elite. That is, globalization is, uh, is, is, is actually the tool, if you like, an arrangement of the world in which the transnational elite, which includes people like us, benefit more than those people who are not able to move around and enjoy the benefit of cosmopolitan food and tastes and various other kinds. Okay, so in other words, uh, the idea is that common people had been left out of uh, the globalization network that we had. Now, since the lives of most people is only meaningful within uh, their own tangible communities, it is noted that the idea of globalization is far too remote and politically inaccessible to people. In other words, uh, globalization is all very good, and people like us can make sense of it. But people who live in the hinterland, people who live in the rural areas, do not and cannot relate to it because it's too abstract and it benefits the transnational. It is claimed, furthermore, that the policy focus on global interconnectivity has not only resulted in growing inequalities, but this has also that, but this focus is fundamentally undemocratic, since access to global institutions is only available to the very few. In other words, uh, uh, globalization is an exclusivist ideology. Okay, it excludes lots and lots of people, and those people are now fighting back. And of course, they have champions in, uh, um, in various uh, um, um, politicians who are perfectly happy, even as they are cosmopolitan and globalist, uh, to take advantage of it, to actually use it in a whole range of ways. So, globalization and its discontents, in summary, is that it has produced wide-ranging and uh, growing social and economic inequalities within and across nations, and some people have benefited from it and others haven't. And those who have not are the majority and they are now speaking up. Okay? They are now shouting back. They are now, the subaltern has come to haunt the globalist. Economic burden of global and economic transformation is too much for people to carry. So uh, automation of industries 
and automation of many aspects of our lives are okay for some who benefit from it, but most people don't. Many people lose their jobs. Many people have uh, their farms being sold to multinationals who can bring in huge tractors and look after the thing, the, 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 the land that was plowed by one or two people in a small area. So these are the kind of problems that people are saying. And this has also given rise to the emergence of the precariat within decline, with the declining life chances. <coughs> that is, those people whose lives have become precarious, uncertain, and um, somehow unpredictable. And they feel that somehow uh, this precarity is a consequence not only of technology, but also of globalization. The ways in which trade is now organized, the ways in which things are shipped from one part of the world to another part of the world at the speed of, uh, of, uh, of, of, of planes. Growing experiences of physical, economic, and social and cultural insecurity has resulted from it. And this has also given rise to what's called democratic deficit through the loss of national and local control and self-determination. In different countries, these things are being experienced differently. In India, for example, uh, it is the, 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 the fact that globalization is assumed to be undermining the local traditions, local religions. That, so it's the cultural aspects and the consequences of globalization. Whereas in the United States, quite a lot of it is about economic. Okay? And in this country, it is also about economic. In India, which has been experiencing growth of around 5% per year, those economic arguments don't necessarily apply. But what does apply is the inequality that it has generated, where there have been huge billionaires on the one hand and people who are living in direly uh, very difficult lives on the others. Fears of growing levels of immigration and resultant cultural diversity and loss of cultural tradition has also given problems. So those are some of the problems that have been identified. And I think it's wrong to assume that some of them are not legitimate. Uh, it is wrong to assume that uh, something needs to be done, for example, about economic insecurity and cultural um, alienation and uh, economic inequalities uh, and growing inequalities. And uh, of course, uh, perhaps uh, the demographic shifts at the rapid rate that are taking place as well. So, we need to recognize, without any doubt in my view, that sentiments of patriotism and nationalism are unlikely to disappear anytime soon. We cannot assume that nationalism is not a powerful force in people's lives. People feel really proud and happy when their country wins a cricket test match, which doesn't happen to England all that often. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, no, but those are sentiments are deeply, deeply embedded in our lives. Okay, and we cannot assume that they're somehow going to disappear. Um, now, at the same time, an empirical understanding of the global interconnectivity or the rationalist appeal to pure reason are not sufficient to generate ethical sensibilities. In other words, you cannot say to people, look, globalization is producing all these benefits because people are not prepared to buy reason when deep emotions, deep affect is involved. Okay? They just don't want to know. Please go away, they say, because uh, what is important is uh, the relationship that I have to my country, to my tribe, to my ethnicity, to my religion, and so on. So I think it is fundamentally mistaken to assume that by educating with reason and facts, we are going to change these sensibilities of anti-globalization kind. It's just wrong, okay? It's just proven to be empirically false, as simple as that, okay? The relationship between ideas of global inter inter interconnectivity and interdependence is therefore complex and contingent and not abstract, okay? It is affect different people in different ways. In considering this uh, uh, relationship, the politics of emotions cannot be assumed to be irrelevant to normative claims on the ground that they are empirically unreliable. So we can say as much as we like about how 
globalization and global trade has benefited us. And how, look at the stock market. Look at the, um, the ways in which uh, uh, we have created all these new companies. And look at the ways in which we are now able to talk on our iPhone. Those things don't register hugely. And um, there is huge amount of evidence that suggests that that is the case. And as a result, what this suggests is the need to understand the politics of emotions, how emotions are created, and how senses of belonging become really quite important to people. And also, it is argued, the world is not a community in a relevant sense, and that cosmopolitan focus on global interconnectivity cannot be expected to generate an ethical attitude in any concrete sense. In other words, we cannot say in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a generalized way that uh, 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 interconnectivity is a necessarily a good thing because interconnectivity has also been shown to produce a whole range of negative and disastrous sometimes outcomes. So we are inherently social beings who require a sense of belonging to a tangible political community, a community that we can recognize, the community that is within our grasp, uh, uh, with which uh, we can identify, united by a common project of living together in some concrete sense rather than in some abstract sense. The trouble with much of the rhetoric of globalization and global citizenship education is it has been articulated largely in a very abstract term. And as a result, the concrete examples of the benefits of connectivities have not been presented with any conviction, with any degree of uh, uh, persuasion. So those are the kind of things that we've just got to recognize. Okay? We've got to actually understand that uh, emotions are involved. We've got to say the pure reason doesn't do it. Facts are no longer that connectivity can produce good and bad results and that connectivity is presented in an abstract fashion rather than in some concrete sense. At the same time, however, it is hard to imagine a world in which the number of people who are globally mobile will not continue to rise. Even with the shaming of flights uh, uh, and all those sort of things that has become incredibly popular in some academic circles and some policy circles. There is no, no evidence, there is no indication, there are no prospects that global mobility is going to decline, okay? That uh, global mobility is continuing. Why? Because so much of our economy has become fundamentally based on global mobility. Have a look at Terminal 5. Have a look at the 39 uh, or so um, five-star hotels. They're all linked to, they're all linked to an economy that is predicated on mobility of people. Have a look at universities. Just imagine what would happen if all of you who are international students suddenly packed up your bag and said, I don't want to be mobile, I want to stay in my own um, village or my own city. Okay? Universities around the world will collapse. Okay? Collapse. We have estimated that if only the Chinese students in Australia stopped coming tomorrow, then 25% of our universities will go bankrupt. <laughs> That's how important you are to us, okay? 25% of you. In other words, uh, our salaries, faculty salaries, our administrator salaries, our capital projects, the new buildings that we are building, is being built on the logic of mobility, okay? The logic of mobility. That is, it is impossible to imagine that uh, we are going to actually abandon mobility. Okay, even though it has all kinds of uh, environmental problems. Rapid developments in information technology and social media will persist. In other words, uh, uh, there is no stopping of uh, Amazon, of Google, of uh, Intel, of Cisco, of Microsoft, of Apple, pulling back and sort of saying, oh, we've had enough technology. <laughs> okay, we're not going to make any advances. <laughs> okay, <laughs> let people catch up. That's not going to happen. 
So that is also a factor that will enable the global connectivity to continue. So just as I've presented our arguments, while there are arguments that nationalism will persist, I'm presenting now arguments why globalism is going to persist. Okay? And in other words, uh, it is going to bring people together across vast distances, bringing us closer together, whether we like it or not. In other words, the kind of things that we'll watch on YouTube will be from around the world. The kind of things that we interact with each other may potentially be. We may even start dating people from across the borders. May, may already have, I'm too old to know. <laughs> okay? Um, you know, we're, those are kind of things. In other words, emotional attachment across national borders is going to be continue, and this little thing called iPhone will help us do that. The economic development will continue to be largely based on expanding services sector and a culture of consumption. In 1965, 70% of Australian economy was based on goods, manufacturing, and, uh, and agriculture. Tangible things. Okay, minerals, etc. 70%. Last year, it was 30%. 70 to 30. Our economy has changed, not only by becoming globalized, but by becoming services orientated. What is services? What do we call services? What are the items that go into services? Well, hospitality and tourism is one. Aviation is another. Retail is another. Security is another. All of these things are predicated on interculturality and mobility. Interculturality. The things that we sell, we sell to diversity of cultural backgrounds. Things we engage with are, 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 are predicated on people in Moba. Go and have a look at a whole range of services. And it is estimated by a number of economists who work on these things is that 80% of services economy is based on mobility of a global kind. 80%, 80% of 70%. You're looking at majority of our economy predicated on mobility and interculturality. Because we're interested in trying out other tastes. We're interested in consumer tastes that are predicated on, uh, on, on, on cultural exchange. Cultures are inevitably rubbing up against each other. Okay? Mobility does that. Technology does that. And our economy does that. Okay? In other words, uh, <laughs> if I were to actually create the perfect curriculum for, uh, for, for school, schools, secondary school, let's say, okay? On the basis of where the jobs are likely to be alone, in other words, a thoroughly vocational curriculum, I would not be encouraging people to learn coding. I would be encouraging them to learn interculturality and intercultural communication. That's where the jobs will be and are already. Okay, of course coding is important. Of course technology is important. I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is uh, the assumptions that the, the nationalists and ethno-nationalists are making runs counter to the facts before us about increasing levels of global connectivity, increasing levels of global mobility, which is unlikely to reverse course. There'll be growing levels of intercultural exchange resulting from global flows of cultural ideas, information, and taste, a major component of the growing services economy. So think about the services economy and how important it is. Education, of course, is part of services economy. We are part of services economy. We are serving students. 
They are our customers. They are our clients. There is thus no turning back from cultural diversity, from cultural exchange, and from cultural hybridity. It's things which have already happened and there is no turning back. Okay? There is no turning back. And yet, the things that have happened have themselves created their reaction to them. Okay? And that reaction is uh, the nationalism and especially ethno-nationalism. Where we are looking for cultural singularity, where we are looking for cultural clarity, we are looking for cultural essentialism, where we are looking for cultural uh, separation, if you like, so that we can feel that we are ambiguously definable. We can actually be told who we are without somebody sort of saying, mm, you are, but you are also this. Okay? We don't want that. In other words, uh, hybridity has given rise to uh, a certain degree of anxiety. And I think that we are seeing that. So, what these ontological, I'm using the term ontological quite deliberately here, okay? Ontological realities suggest is that global interactive, interconnect, interconnectivity, sorry, it should be interconnectivity, cannot be wished away. But the ways in which it's interpreted and addressed will continue to be politically contested, as indeed will be the modes of cultural exchange and hi hybridity. In other words, the interconnectivity will continue. Okay? But the ways in which we will think about interconnectivity will be a site of considerable political contestation. And that will continue to figure out what are the modes of cultural exchange that should be encouraged and what are the modes that should be discouraged and what forms of hybridity are valuable, desirable and morally appropriate and which are not. Those things will be debate, debated but what will not be debated is that the cultures are going to rub up against each other. Okay? Assumptions of a possible return to culturally homogeneous socially unchanging and politically inert societies is sadly from the point of view of ethno-nationalism is an illusion even if the notions of nationalism and patriotism are unlikely to die out so what we are seeing is a major tension between globalism and global interconnectivity and its ubiquity and mobility and on the other hand reaction to it in the forms of ethno-nationalism. So, there is therefore no avoiding contingency, uncertainty, complexity and difference in communities shaped by growing levels of mobility and technological innovation. There is no way that we cannot actually take seriously what contingency might mean for us, how we might manage uncertainty how we might think about complexity and difference. Those things are here to stay. So any particular moral order or educational order that we might develop will have to take into account those four ontological realities, realities in relation to contingency, uncertainty, complexity and difference. <coughs> Claims of universal moral truths are unlikely to be uh, acceptable to culturally diverse, globally interconnected and networked society. In other words, if you posited a set of universal moral truths, then you may be satisfied and you may think that transcendentally, in terms of the pure exercise of reason alone, you've been able to come up with these definitive moral truths. Other people are not necessarily going to agree. Okay, as a result, that tension over moral truths is going to continue to persist. And I think these ontological reality certainly are suggesting this kind of tension. Now, contemporary ethno-nationalist populism against these trends shows remarkable similarities across nations, but also some differences. 
in some countries, the main concern is cultural innovation. In other countries, it is the aspects of. It is predicated on an antagonism between the people and the elite. In other words, the assumption is that people have generalized will, okay, which has been undermined by the elite institutions and elite people. Okay? And as a result, this populism is really this, uh, the story of this antagonism. Okay? Now, of course, when you say what is the general will, what is the common will, then populists assume that they know what they are, that is. Okay? How do they know? Because in some cases, of course, they have shown themselves to enjoy major majoritarian support, like in India. 65% voted for Modi and, uh, and uh, BJP just recently. And he's pursuing a particular kind of, uh, particular kind. In other countries, they do not get, they do not get a majority. But just the same, they make an assumption about general will or common will of the common people that had somehow been corruptly manipulated against them. So Mr. Trump did not get a majority vote, three million less in fact. And yet they think that it's only because the corrupt elites that we didn't get it. Now that is a view that, in other words, the idea of the will of the common people is a presupposition rather than an empirical fact. Okay? In other words, it's assumed. In some cases, it is assumed because it is supposed to be divinely given to the people. Divinely. Let me say what, that, what I mean by the way of linking religion to ethno-nationalism. It's assumed that the general will is an expression of what is the divine will. It's only expressed through people. And if it is not expressed the, the, uh, through the people, then axiomatically there is something fishy going on. Axiomatically something corrupt has gone on. Okay? Some exploitation of the system has gone on. Because people in their goodness will in necessarily express their will towards a, a particular way of thinking about it. So in that sense, religion and popular conception of the will of the people are brought together. They have been incredibly successful in addition to this in persuading people that the main source of economic inequalities lies not in economic order, or economic arrangements of the world, but uh, in their cultural discontent. In other words, uh, people have sort of said that the reason why you're not doing so well is because of the cultural elites. It's the cultural that is regarded as the explanation. And there is, of course, as a result, demonization of international and regional multilateral organizations. <coughs> What is the source of the corruption against the general will of the people? Those are multinational. In the United States, where I lived for 10 years, that sentiment is deeply, deeply held. Anti-UNESCO sentiments are quite extensive because it is assumed that the United Nations is corrupt and that it is always undermining American interest or the interest of the general will of the American people. Okay? And as a result, uh, multi, uh, multilateral institutions and regional institutions like EU, for example, is considered to be inherently corrupt, inherently corrupt, and is out there undermining our, our interest. Okay? And our here is the dangerous pronoun that is simply presupposed. We, we, who are the we? We are those people who are the generalized conception of the people, the people, not just people, but the people. 
assumption that national control of policy is both possible and ameliorative. That if only we go back to the pre-global era or globalization era, then somehow we'll be able to control things better. And as a result, there is bolting of a growing sense of uh, economic anxiety to a new politics of ethno-nationalism. There is a discursive assemblage of <coughs> conflicting <coughs> ideological concepts that are grounded in affect and emotions. And that's basically what is happening. It's also argued the neoliberal imaginary of globalization has produced social alienation. The markets, the global markets have produced. This populism masks the fest, the source of that may not be global interconnectivity as such, but the neoliberal terms in which it is defined. So it is possible to sort of say that globalization and global trade has been unfair. <coughs> but the problem, of course, is, is instead of saying that it's a particular form of globalization that is at fault, global connectivity generally, in abstraction, is considered to be at fault. Okay? That means there is a, there is a kind of a distinction made. It's a particular imaginary of globalization that may be the source of social alienation and in global inequalities. But what the solution is, is that we must do away with globalization altogether, and not only at a particular form of it. The terms are located in a particular thought of system of thought, a neoliberal imaginary, as I call, that assumes the economization of subjects. Failure to acknowledge that institutions that have produced the terms of neoliberal globalization are actually Anglo-American constructs. And that ethno-nationalism uh, ethno of Trump and Brexit and so on observates the, cre the, the, the contradictions of the neo global, um, neoliberal imaginary of globalization rather than seeing globalization generally to be problematic. So it's possible to say that there is one aspect of globalization that has produced all these problems that have emerged of global inequalities and so on. That's one thing. But it's quite another to sort of saying any globalization and any form of connectivity is problematic. And that sort of says, where is this connectivity going to come from? Unfortunately, in recent years, there's been doubling down of neoliberal imaginary. Okay, uh, even as people have. Now, I want to finish off by saying something about how this has unsettled higher education internationalization. At one level, it discourages, to some extent, student and faculty mobility. So it says that uh, the institutions that exist that encourage this mobility must necessarily be corrupt because they are part of the elite. An elite is a fairly important. It undermines the efforts to internationalize the curriculum, to pluralize it, because it's supporting a particular essentialist, ethno-nationalist view of the curriculum. And as a result, huge amount is being done to actually ensure that the curriculum becomes uh, as nationally defined as possible. A lot of people don't recognize, but when Mr. Trump was appointed, he appointed Betsy DeVos as the Secretary of Education, who looked after the governance aspects of it, but he also appointed a guy called uh, Franklin, uh, Franklin Graham as the guy who was going to actually develop a particular orientation towards the distinctively American curriculum. American curriculum. In other words, it never succeeded because most people objected to such a construct. But nonetheless, the idea was to actually show internationalization of the curriculum to be a problematic thing. There will be negative aspects of attempts at academic and research collaboration, as countries will in increasingly sort of say, oh, there are problems with this. And uh, it may actually lead to uh, people sort of not celebrating collaboration, but saying, we'll do collaboration, but under the table. OK? Because we do not want to offend the the, 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 the majority or the people who are anti-globalization. It will disturb attempts at a more coherent relationship between higher education work and labor market. 
and it will undermine higher education's positive role in public diplomacy. There are a huge range of benefits to be had from higher education internationalization. Uh, and we've seen many of those, and I've talked about those. But alongside, there is this inevitable reaction to them. And I think we need to actually understand that reaction in order to figure out how we are going to create a space in between those competing ideologies, competing ways in which. Because unless we do it, then higher education institution, edu, international, how higher education as a system will be increasingly dismissed as uh, elite and potentially corrupt. And as a result, the division between the town and gown, which has existed for as long as higher educations have existed, is going to become even more intense rather than something that is brought together. Globalization cannot be wished away. Growing role of communication technologies in forging transnational and, and intercultural exchange is here to stay. But the terms in which it is defined and how it is defined to take into account the emotional bound, bind that they ha people have to the nation is something that needs to be investigated. But internationalization of most sector of economy is proceeding. Growing importance of the services economy. Interdependence of nations and communities. Growing role of the diaspora communities in promoting higher education internationalism. And of course the rise of Asia in the emerging geopolitics of higher education in school. These things are happening. But these things are also potentially, potentially undermined by a parallel political development that is taking place. And unless we come actually to figure out how those two parallel ways of imagining the world and imagining our communities is, is thought about in much more serious, ethically sound and culturally productive way, then I fear that uh, higher education may become a site for struggle between the globalist and the nationalist. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Hassan. We have some time for questions, actually, so it's a great thing. So um, uh, I think there are lots of very interesting um, ideas there. Hopefully, we wrote some ideas. Door is open. Do I need to stand up? <laughs> no, you don't. <laughs> well, uh, uh, you just said like the majority can't get benefit from the globalization, and the president or the power of the country, um, well, we would consider that they need to be given to the majority. And so, can we think that um, the corruption and assumption is good for one country? Because without this, what country will against the globalism? Mm -hmm. Because the the majority didn't get benefited. Mm -hmm. So maybe this kind of objection would influ influence the development of one country in this glo globalized society. Absolutely, I think you're right. Um, in terms of uh, much of the economic rise of countries will depend on the extent to which they work with other countries. Okay, That is, uh, I have no doubt that services industry in particular re requires people to interact with each other. Okay, uh, What is likely to happen though is uh, that the benefits of that interconnection, if it's not widely and equally distributed, will continue to give rise to the nationalist as well, okay, to ethno-nationalist. And we are going to actually experience a, 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 a experience continuing and continuous conflict between the globalists. And it may be that the future site of conflict is not going to be classes, ruling class and working class, as is the case in traditional socialism and co communism. It may be that the traditional site of conflict may be between those people 
who favor some kind of ethno-nationalism and those who actually recognize the benefits of globalism. and the response of globalization and um, and globalization like unsettling the higher education sector but uh, I'm thinking like um, as it's the expression and response at the same time can higher education um, system do something to diminish the e emotion like as if there's no turning way turning around, there's no turning back to the non-globalization uh, stage so how can higher education contribute to the globalization or um, in other way by um, that the uh, goal of higher education can include preparing internationalization citizenship? Sure, sure. Um, the problem, I mean, it's not that higher education institutions haven't been doing anything in order to encourage, in order, in order to teach, in order to educate people about the benefits of global interconnectivity and global exchange and global economy. In fact, if you go and have a look at our mission statements and strategic plans, they're full of rhetoric about that. And a lot of people have tried to do that as well. Okay? And some fantastic projects have been initiated. My criticism of some of those is that they're presented in such abstract way. Okay? outside the concrete e examples of the concrete that they have been largely un un uh, effective. That they have been predicated on the logic of reason and quite often ignoring the logic of emotions as well. We've got to start thinking about new ways of doing global citizenship education, no less. Okay, which have not worked. I think we've got to be honest that we have been pursuing multiculturalism, we've been producing equity policies, we've been pursuing all of internationalization policies, we've been pursuing uh, interculturalism, etc., etc., etc. Okay? So we've been doing quite a bit. But I think what the rise of populism and ethno nationalism does is invites us, or perhaps pressures us, to sort of saying, hang on, have those things really worked? And if they haven't, what aspects of those educational innovations and educational initiatives that we have been participating in have, may have, in fact, produced its complete opposite? It's a time to be reflexive about what we have done in the last 30, 40 years ourselves. It may be that the liberal democratic agenda that we have pursued on the basis of enlightenment reason has not quite worked. So new ways of thinking about it are necessary. So I think higher education have got a great deal to do in this space. But if we're going to do it in exactly the same way as we've done it in the past, then we may not succeed. Okay, more of the same, new approaches are required, new ways of thinking about our work, new ways of Thinking about bringing reason and emotion together is required. Okay? Uh, and uh, that's going to be a tough task, which means uh, doing, um, re critically reflecting upon those policies and those programs, like multicultural education and all those things, that we hold most dear to our hearts. Okay? We have wedded our careers to that. But we've now got a sort of saying, circumstances have emerged that not only require us to understand those new circumstances, but also have a look at the kind of uh, things that we did that produced those circumstances. Thank you for your presentation. And in your presentation, you, you mentioned it lays for quite a uh, uh, quite a lot of times, and what kind of people can be qualified as elites? Are the knowledgeable people such as a professors in our faculty or uh, somebody else? And what's your comment on elite, that the, role that, the role that the elite play in the international education and yeah. higher, 
to the international development and higher education. Sure. Okay. Two very interesting and important questions. Uh, who are the elites? Okay. Um, different countries have defined elites differently. Okay. So elites are not necessarily some kind of empirically fixed category. So for example, let me give you an example. In the United States, the people who have a huge amount of power in trying to shape people's emotional life are the evangelical leaders. And yet not once have they been referred to as the elite. Okay? In other words, uh, you're selective. You know? So basically, quite often, elites are, reg uh, us, are regarded as those people who do not believe in us, however we define ourselves to be us. Okay? And of course, us gets defined differently in different places. All right? So that's actually what elite. Elite is a category that is a relational category rather than an empirically fixed category. In other words, uh, it's those people that we think are corrupt and doing damage that we call elite. And having defined elite, then they can do no, nothing else but the corrupt. You see what I mean? So it's a very complicated logic of elite ascription. Who is regarded as elite is not just simply sort of saying, here is the definition and we tick the boxes. It's looking at the kind of political, cultural, and economic relations in which some people are politically regarded as the other who are not in our camp. Okay? Now, in the United States, it's quite clear that uh, media is regarded as elite. It is quite clear that education, uh, especially higher education, is regarded as elite. It is quite clear that the public servants, civil servants, are regarded as the elite. And politicians on the other side are regarded as the elite. Whichever the other side is. See what I mean? So that's actually... Now, the other question was about international development. Is, can you say that again? Uh, yeah. What's your comment on the role the elite play in the international development? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, yeah, sure. Well, I mean... Um, there are some countries uh, where uh, Papua New Guinea, uh, where I was about uh, 12 months ago, people were talking about elite. And top of the list of who they regarded as the elite were the international development actors from the global north. On the top of their list. Okay? In other words, uh, the people who came with bags of money, but also bags of conditions, <laughs> were regarded as the elite. Okay? So in that sense, in developing countries, okay, elite include international development partners and people who do donate money and so on because of the contradictions that they have generated as far as their cultural and economic formation is concerned. Okay, uh, so I think what we're looking at is uh, when you say international development, whether they're elite, okay, then it depends on where you're looking at, okay? <laughs> if you look at some developing countries, it certainly is the case that international development agents are regarded as elite, not only elite, but outsider elites, not only within our own community, but somewhere else who are coming in, in their corrupt fashion, to undermine our culture and our economy. Even when they give you loads of money. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. Thank you very much. Well, I'm interested in the term that how you use globalization and internationalization. Could it interchange? Yeah. And for me, globalization uh, associated with one uh, that is neoliberalism. Yeah. At the same time, I am all in favor of internationalization <coughs> and also international. Yeah, I'm yeah. Building myself, uh, myself international. But globalization associated with neoliberalism. And yeah. people you mentioned 
uh, right, is left behind from the, the policies of neoliberalism, neoliberalism, they are on the ground. They are anti-globalists, maybe. But the people at the top, let's say from Trump to Erdogan, to Bolsonaro, to mm -hmm. uh, other leaders who are on the left hand, mm -hmm. they are, in my opinion, they are not anti-global. Like globalization, because they lack the influence of other places. Yeah. Because they need imperialism. USA yeah, yeah. is not yeah. uh, thinking they are not global. They want to control. Yeah. China, they yeah. want to control some. And Turkey. Yeah, Turkey yeah. is invasion sure. of Syria, the northern uh, uh, South Kurdistan, so, yeah, yeah. is part of mm -hmm. and parcel of this neoliberal agenda, sure. in, in my opinion. And the neoliberal agenda created poor yeah. in Britain. Yeah. One in five children. Yeah, yeah. Living in poverty. Right. Britain is one of the richest places. Mm -hmm. And when we talk to those people who were left behind, they don't always say that I am proud of, I want to have a proud national identity. They say, I want a better education. Yeah, yeah. I want a better health service. Yeah, yeah. So it is. As a contradiction, isn't it? As, uh, as those people who look for the nationalist people who are nationalists. A proposed nationalist view, and they are using nationalism in order to implement more neoliberalism. Yeah. Because none of the uh, leaders are sure. anti uh, uh, privatization. They want to privatize. Yeah. Nobody wants to privatize. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, how yeah. would you yeah, yeah. Uh, say yeah. that? But what no, uh, you mentioned we need to look at from different perspectives. What would you suggest as a different sure, alternative? Sure. Well, the first. Because we talk about Brexit and the European Union as a corrupt organization. I mean, the European Union itself is created us and them. Yeah. The refugees, 40,000 people died in the Mediterranean Sea. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Frontex is a naval organization which yeah, yeah. has been patrolling the Mediterranean Sea, sent refugees to Turkey and Libya. Yeah, yeah. And this is a part and sure. parcel of neoliberal agenda. Yeah, yeah. How can we, and this is part of global agenda, yeah. how can we, uh, yeah. what is the alternative to you think? Yeah, thank you. Uh, to begin with, I uh, know perfectly well that uh, a large number of people um, of my political ilk see globalization and neoliberalization as almost interchangeable that there is no other definition of globalization possible that does not work against uh, that. And of course, that's how globalization has been developed as a matter of historical fact. Going back to the early 90s and World Trade uh, summits and all those sort of things against which um, social movements fought. Okay, So that is true. I'm saying that to identify globalization, all aspects of it, as intrinsically and inevitably neoliberal, is wrong. I don't, I don't go along with that. Okay? I want to say that there is a neoliberal imaginary of globalization that is hegemonic, that is dominant, but not universal. Okay? In other words, it is possible to imagine global interconnectivity, global mobility, global exchange. It is possible to actually develop a view of globalization that is not tied to. Empirically, that conception does not exist at the moment. But to actually assume that it's not possible is also, I think, uh, problematic in my view. So I make a distinction between globalization as a description in a general way, about how uh, ideas move, how trade is being done, how nations get together, how mobility happens. But there is a neoliberal reading of all those things, and there is a non-neoliberal. Because actually, if not making the distinction is uh, required, then you do not have an analysis of interconnectivity, mobility, trade, etc., etc., that is not, that is global but not neoliberal. So I make a distinction. Now I know that most people 
in my tribe, <laughs> you know, on the, on broadly on the left politics, uh, do not go along with them. But I make a strong argument that we should. Okay? That is, analytically, it's useful. Not only heuris heuristically, but in terms of a developing a normal agenda for globalization that is disconnected from neoliberal predicts. Okay? While at the same time admitting that at the moment, <laughs> everywhere you look, globalization has been captured, perhaps colonized, by neoliberal assumptions. Okay? So that's actually how I'm looking at it. So in that sense, I think there will be some kind of debate between you and me. Okay? Uh, because, uh, because I'm trying to d develop a he heuristic and analytical space for a globalization that is not necessarily. Thank you so much, Fazal. Mm -hmm. um, well, we've come to the end of the lecture now. Mm -hmm. uh, you can ambush Fazal <laughs> on his way out if you have really some really important questions. Um, thankfully, Fazal will, will be around. He doesn't have to catch a train tonight. But <laughs> <laughs> Once again, thank you so much, Fazal, for your ideas and the lecture today.